Okay. So have we ever been visited before on Earth by extraterrestrials? You know, there are a lot of people who think that uh, we're being visited now by extraterrestrials. I don't agree with that. But there is a question, maybe we've been visited before. And you can't rule that out. I mean, you can't say categorically, no, aliens did not come to Earth 100 million years ago and take photos of the dinosaurs, maybe a few as pets, and then leave. I mean, we would never know. So you can't, you really can't you can't tell whether we've been visited before, except to say that there's no good evidence of it. Okay, fair enough. Okay, and where in the universe is life likely to be? When we ask ourselves, you know, where should we be looking for extraterrestrial life, right? We always do the same thing. We say, well, where could terrestrial life actually be able to not just flourish once established, but to be established, you know, to get started. Mm. And uh, so we're looking for planets with conditions that are somewhat similar to the plan, uh, to the conditions here on Earth. And the first one and the most famous one uh, to be considered was, of course, Mars, because of all the other worlds in the solar system, Mars is the one that most closely resembles Earth, although not terribly closely. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we look out into the, the galaxy and there are about a trillion, that's with a T, planets in the galaxy. We don't see them all, but that's, that's a rough estimate. And most of them are not very much like Earth, but some are just by chance. It's like buying a trillion lottery tickets. Some will be winners. <laughs> and so, you know, that might be where the, uh, the aliens are hanging out. The only thing is we don't know which planets those are, where they are, what star, what star systems they're orbiting, mm. uh, or, in, you know, which star systems they're in. Mm. And uh, that's just, uh, the, you know, you can write that down to the fact that it's very difficult mm. to find faraway planets. Planets are small, they're dim, uh, it's very hard to find them. Okay. And um, what is uh, SETI's role? Now, SETI tries to sort of short circuit the whole question of is there life elsewhere in the universe by finding not just life, but finding intelligent life. The advantage of looking for intelligent life is that they might have some technology. Maybe they're broadcasting, you know, navigational beacons into the galaxy for the benefit of their spacecraft or who knows what, but they might be able to make themselves known. And that's not true if there are, for example, you know, extra galactic lizards on some planet, as you often see in the sci-fi films, you know, they, they might be living their lizard lives, but you would never know it because they're not producing any evidence that you could measure here on Earth. So in that sense, SETI, yes, is looking for the most sophisticated kinds of life, intelligent life. But on the other hand, that's the kind of life that might make its presence known. Fair enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, what would you, if we had first contact now with with et what would the impact be on society if we were to find et you know by a picking up a radio transmission or you know that kind of thing where we find them at a distance mm. that's just a big story i mean that's a big news story and you can be sure the newspapers and all the other media will be filled with it for quite a while scientists will be extraordinarily interested and uh, immediately start turning every telescope they have in the direction of where this this world is mm. uh, but you know it's very likely that they're going to be far away maybe a hundred light years maybe a thousand light years so uh, you're not going to invite them over for lunch <laughs> on the other hand if you uh say well look what if the aliens came to earth that's a completely different story it's a completely different scenario and it's even potentially dangerous often in the movies it's dangerous mm. and that's because anybody that could actually come here uh you know whatever they want to do they can do it because they're so much more advanced than we are technically it's a bit like uh, the native americans sitting around a campfire in mm. 1490 uh, say <laughs> and then thinking you know there, there might be other societies on the other side of all that water down there uh what if they came here you know <laughs> and uh, they said well we ought to we, we better organize and defend ourselves in case they're aggressive it really didn't matter what they did that other society was much more advanced than theirs by centuries really and consequently, they were able to do whatever they wanted to do, good or bad. Mm. And how would it impact the world's relig religions and faiths? Science has always been at the forefront of trying to explain the unexplainable. When it comes to UFOs, the scientific community has been both intrigued and skeptical. 
The idea of unidentified flying objects from other worlds has captured the imagination of many, but scientists are quick to point out that without concrete evidence, it is difficult to draw any definitive conclusions. One of the main challenges in studying UFOs is the lack of physical evidence. While there have been countless reports of sightings and encounters, very few have been backed up by tangible proof. Without physical evidence, scientists are left with eyewitness accounts and blurry photographs, which are often dismissed as unreliable. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, some scientists have attempted to study UFOs using the tools of their trade. By analyzing radar data, studying the physics of flight, and examining the psychology of eyewitness testimony, scientists have tried to shed light on the mystery of UFOs. However, the results have been inconclusive, with many questions remaining unanswered. One of the biggest challenges in studying UFOs is the stigma attached to the topic. For many scientists, the idea of UFOs is synonymous with pseudoscience and conspiracy theories. As a result, many researchers are hesitant to study UFOs for fear of damaging their reputation. This stigma has made it difficult for serious scientific inquiry into the phenomenon. Despite these challenges, there are some scientists who believe that UFOs deserve further study. By approaching the topic with an open mind and a critical eye, these researchers hope to uncover the truth behind the phenomenon. Whether or not science will ever be able to definitively explain UFOs remains to be seen. Looking to the future, the study of UFOs is likely to continue to be a topic of interest for scientists and researchers. With advances in technology and new tools for observation, scientists may be able to gather more data on UFO sightings and encounters. By combining traditional scientific methods with cutting-edge technology, researchers may be able to finally unravel the mystery of UFOs. In the meantime, the debate over UFOs will continue to rage on. While some will dismiss the phenomenon as a figment of the imagination, others will continue to believe in the possibility of extraterrestrial visitors. As long as there are unanswered questions and unexplained sightings, the study of UFOs will remain a topic of fascination for scientists and the public alike. In conclusion, the science of UFOs is a complex and controversial topic. While scientists have made some progress in studying the phenomenon, many questions remain unanswered. With advances in technology and a willingness to approach the topic with an open mind, scientists may be able to finally unlock the secrets of UFOs. Until then, the mystery of unidentified flying objects will continue to captivate the imagination of many. Nothing to hear. And uh, I've just got an interesting question. Uh, because I'm a scientist. I, I only have a Bachelor of Science from the university, not like yourself. But I'm just wondering about physics and uh, whether there is a room for another model of physics which takes into consideration possible other dimensions uh, of reality and how would that fit in with the search for life elsewhere? Uh, yeah, so in fact, uh, within uh, the mainstream of theoretical physics for the past uh, uh, several decades, uh, the prevailing paradigm is that uh, it uh, is important possible to unify quantum mechanics and gravity unless you work uh, with uh, extra spatial dimensions. And uh, of course, we, we see only three of them in our daily life, uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, the others are curled and we can't really detect them unless we uh, um, shoot particles at exceptionally high energies that would probe these tiny scales. Um, and so that has been the foundation for string theory, um, which uh, has uh, mathematical accomplishments, but yet uh, is uh, not uh, ready to make predictions about the beginning of the universe, not what happened before the Big Bang, and what happens inside the black hole. Um, of course, if there are extra dimensions, then the reality that we are familiar with extends into them. And uh, one can imagine uh, life uh, in more than three spatial dimensions, it will be far more diverse and interesting uh, in the sense that uh, when you drive a highway in extra dimensions, uh, you know, the chance of a collision is much uh, smaller. Uh, and uh, uh, there are many more opportunities for um, uh, degrees of freedom of uh, uh, exercising your uh, free will, if, if we have it. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, all together, I would expect life to be much richer. Wow. Okay. And do you think uh, possibly what we what we're seeing in terms of UFOs and uh, UAPs could that be kind of dimensions crossing over into our reality somehow? Uh, we had our science and technology for one century. Quantum mechanics was discovered exactly a century ago, and all the most sophisticated technologies we currently employ. Uh, such as the internet, uh, artificial intelligence, and so forth, uh, rely on our understanding of quantum mechanics. So uh, one can imagine that the process of learning is incomplete. Uh, in fact, there are several major puzzles in uh, modern physics. What is most of the matter in the universe? We call it dark matter. We don't know what it is. Uh, what happens inside a black hole uh, near the singularity? We don't know what happens. Uh, what happened before the Big Bang? These are some of the uh, examples, but also we don't know whether we are alone or whether there are other technological civilizations. But one thing is clear that most stars formed billions of years before the sun. So um, if uh, another civilization like ours existed uh, billions of years ago, they had much more time to develop their science and technology. And it is possible that they would uh, be able to figure out if there are extra special dimensions and take advantage of them uh, using uh, quantum gravity engineers. And uh, what that means is that, uh, you know, if their technology is able to reach our doorstep, uh, we would be at all because it would represent something we don't possess, we don't understand. Just like a cave dweller coming to a, a city like London or New York and seeing all the um, technological gadgets there, um, there would be a sense of religious awe and we wouldn't f fully understand what we are looking at, uh, especially if one is dealing with the uh, effects of quantum gravity that we have no clue about. So definitely, yes, one way for us to uh, realize that we are not the smartest kid in the class uh, is by encountering those uh, technological gadgets that were produced by more advanced civilizations, and they may very well represent uh, effects of uh, uh, quantum gravity, extra dimensions, things that we currently do not fully understand. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you for that answer. Because the other thing that interests me is, is, is the weirdness of, of, of quantum physics, especially when you look at the double slit experiments and the observer effect. I, I don't know how to explain that, and we still don't know how to explain that. Uh, I wondered if we're ever going to get there and work it out. It is clear that something is missing from uh, quantum mechanics because uh, since the day it was conceived, uh, uh, we didn't have an intuitive uh, understanding of what it means, how a wave function collapses, whether there are many realities at once, and uh, somehow we managed by doing an experiment to go into one of them. Uh, it's quite possible that uh, our lack of understanding of quantum mechanics at a deep level is because it doesn't incorporate gravity. And once uh, gravity and quantum mechanics would be uh, unified in a predictive theory, uh, it will give answers to those questions that, as to what reality truly is. We know that quantum mechanics is more fundamental than classical physics because classical physics is one limit of quantum mechanics. But uh, we are classical objects, uh, we can't really understand uh, what happens in quantum mechanics, but perhaps by adding uh, quantum uh, gravity to the mix, uh, we should uh, get at a more fundamental level where uh, everything uh, follows a set of rules that uh, explains why, uh, why reality is probabilistic in the case of uh, quantum mechanics in difference from classical physics. Okay, thank you. And what do you think about the the theory that some have put forward that life in the universe is just a big simulation kind of game? <laughs> um, I have a, a difficulty uh, believing that uh, we live in a simulation because uh, so far I haven't seen any evidence for pixelization of uh, space. I haven't seen any bug in the computer program. To me, uh, reality is uh, has a unique feature, which is all of us are witnessing it. Uh, whereas if you put goggles on your head, uh, you could live in a virtual reality in the metaverse, uh, but others would not. And uh, of course, it may be more satisfying to you, just like taking recreational drugs. So 
<laughs> the way I think of it is people who believe in the multiverse, uh, mm -hmm. that there are many realities at once, that everything that is possible uh, happens uh, an infinite number of times, uh, you know, they have no evidence for that to be the case. Uh, and it's somewhat irresponsible because uh, it doesn't make a prediction that could be ruled out. If everything is possible, <laughs> then nothing uh, is impossible and therefore nothing is ruled out. And uh, the way we learn, the way we gain scientific knowledge is by chopping off the heads of wrong ideas using the guillotine of experiments. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that is not available in the context of the multiverse, uh, then it's, it's not science the way I'm, I'm used to. And of course, it could be very satisfying, just like taking drugs can bring uh, make you high and uh, happier uh, during that time. Uh, however, I'm much more uh, uh, interested in the reality that we all share, because if we understand it, we can adapt to it. Uh, an, an example for a virtual reality is that we live in the center of the universe. Uh, it ended up being wrong. Um, and once we understand that, we can, for example, reach Mars. If we were to think that Mars orbits around the Earth, we would never reach it because we would send our rockets in the wrong direction. Uh, and um, in the same way, uh, if we understand uh, what a virus is, we can try and cope with it uh, using vaccines. If, if we understand uh, that there are extra dimensions, we can take advantage of them. If we understand that we are not alone, we might want to uh, protect our privacy, uh, or we might want to visit cosmic neighbors to learn from them about our technological future. So knowing the reality always is advantageous because even though it's not uh, uh, necessarily uh, uh, complementing our ego, uh, it might uh, bring us uh, to a, a better future because once we understand it, we can design our life such that uh, it would accommodate reality and use it for our interests. And so the bottom line is uh, I would uh, much rather study the reality that we all share, that we can test and make progress on. And of course, there is always metaphysics, ideas that we can never test. These existed uh, throughout human history in the realm of philosophy, in the realm of uh, religion. But that's not what I'm interested in. Sure. Okay. Thank you for that great answer. And just finally, uh, I've heard you speak out recently that you wish there were more scientists taking UAPs and possible alien life more seriously. Uh, so I praise you for your work, your scientific work that you're doing, and you're doing it in the right way, uh, like you said. Uh, do you think more mainstream scientists should come on board? Yeah, I do believe that the search for uh, alien civilizations should be in the mainstream of science. First, because it resonates with the public and the public funds science. And we have the scientific tools to address this question. We can use uh, our cameras, our telescopes, our microscopes, uh, based on my latest uh, expedition to the Pacific Ocean, to learn what's outside the solar system and to figure out whether we have a neighbor. Uh, the reason it's uh, transformative for humanity is uh, for the same reason that finding a partner changes your life. Uh, suddenly you're not alone. Steven uh, Weinberg, uh, a Nobel laureate in physics, uh, wrote the, towards the end of his book, The First Three Minutes, uh, the more uh, we analyze the universe, uh, the more pointless it looks. And uh, to me, that's a sign of studying uh, lifeless objects. Uh, mm -hmm. Objects like partic elementary particles, uh, radiation, uh, stars, black holes, and so forth. Uh, however, the minute we find a partner that is just like us, uh, conscious and intelligent, uh, it will change our perspective. Suddenly, the universe will not appear lonely anymore. <laughs> and moreover, we can learn from our partner. Uh, we can grow in our perspective. As of now, we are investing $2 trillion a year on military budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were to realize that there is a third dimension out there, that uh, mm -hmm. there is much more real estate in space than there is on Earth, uh, we might decide to explore space. And if we were to invest $2 trillion a year mm -hmm. uh, in space exploration, after listening to the words of uh, John Lennon 
imagine all the people living in peace. Uh, <laughs> then I calculated we could reach all stars in the Milky Way galaxy uh, by sending probes to them, billions of them, within a century. The probes will get there within a billion years, but we would at least uh, approach those stars within just one century. And if there is a, a, a more intelligent civilization out there, my hope is that they did it already. And we can just look at our uh, backyard to check if any of their probes reached us and learn from those. Okay, that's a brilliant answer. I love that. John Lennon and Avi Loeb on Love TV. Project Blue Beam is a top secret military project that has been the subject of much speculation and controversy in recent years. Many believe that it is a government program designed to deceive the public through the use of advanced technology, while others see it a potential tool for communicating with extraterrestrial beings. The origins of Project Blue Beam can be traced back to the 1980s, when rumors began to circulate about a secret government program that was experimenting with holographic technology. According to some sources, the project was originally conceived as a means of creating realistic simulations of UFO sightings in order to study public reactions to such events. As the project evolved, however, it reportedly took on a more sinister purpose. Some conspiracy theorists claim that Project Blue Beam is part of a larger plan to create a false flag alien invasion in order to unite humanity under a single world government. According to this theory, the government would use holographic projections to create the illusion of an extraterrestrial invasion, thereby justifying the implementation of martial law and the suspension of civil liberties. Despite the lack of concrete evidence to support these claims, many continue to believe in the existence of Project Blue Beam and its potential implications for the future of humanity. Some have even gone so far as to suggest that recent UFO sightings are actually part of a larger government conspiracy to prepare the public for the eventual implementation of the project. But what is the science behind Project Blue Beam and how does it relate to UFOs? While the exact details of the project remain shrouded in secrecy, it is widely believed that the technology being developed for Project Blue Beam is based on advanced holographic projection techniques. Holography is a technique that allows three-dimensional images to be created using laser light. By projecting these images onto a screen or into the air, it is possible to create realistic illusions that appear to be solid objects. This technology has been used in a variety of applications, from entertainment to medical imaging, and has the potential to revolutionize the way we interact with the world around us. In the context of Project Blue Beam, holographic technology could be used to create convincing simulations of UFO sightings, alien spacecraft, and other phenomena that would be indistinguishable from reality. By manipulating light and sound in precise ways, it would be possible to create the illusion of a full-scale alien invasion that would be virtually impossible to distinguish from the real thing. Of course, the success of such a project would depend on a number of factors, including the sophistication of the technology being used, the skill of the operators, and the willingness of the public to believe in the illusion being presented to them. While it is impossible to say for certain whether Project Blue Beam is a real program, or simply a figment of the imagination, the potential implications of such a project are certainly worth considering. In conclusion, Project Blue Beam is a mysterious and controversial military project that has captured the imagination of conspiracy theorists and skeptics alike. While the true nature of the project remains unknown, its potential implications for the future of humanity are both fascinating and frightening. Whether or not Project Blue Beam is real, the science behind it is certainly intriguing, and the possibility of using holographic technology to create convincing illusions of UFOs and alien invasions is a concept that is both exciting and terrifying. Only time will tell what the future holds for Project Blue Beam and its potential impact on the world.
Brilliant. Uh, my second question really is something a bit out there, really. Uh, I've come across this thing called Project Bluebeam. Is this just an internet conspiracy myth or is this some some top secret military project? Do we know? Well, Project Bluebeam has has been around for many years in, in terms of, of rumors circulating on on the Internet. And, uh, you, you know, like all like all good conspiracy theories, it probably does have a few roots in reality, but probably not in the way that most people think. Mm. Simply put, Project Bluebeam is the idea that through a combination of maybe holographic projection technology, mm. Hollywood special effects and government or deep state spin mm. and manipulation, you could create a false narrative. Mm. And the, the two examples that have been given are you could create basically a false flag alien invasion or a false flag second coming. Mm. And what this would then do, it, it would rather like some people say, well, 9-11 led to the introduction of the Patriot Act and mm -hmm. big state, deep state coming in and maybe maybe taking some rights and freedoms that we previously had and and dressing this up in the flag and dressing it up as national interest and the need for unity and and the very extreme circumstances which temporarily of course um mm -hmm. mitigate for the setting aside of of normal checks and balances and processes and and so this is project blue beam the idea that you could fake an alien invasion, for example, and yeah. and then use it to manipulate populations and, and the new world order takes over. I don't, frankly, believe it as told, but yeah. self-evidently all these things in their separate components do exist. Mm -hmm. There is holographic projection. We don't yet know how good it is because a lot of that's classified, but one hears rumors of the so-called ghost gun that can create very realistic um, portrayals of things and of course we all know spin exists in government and and of course we've seen during covid the way in which entire populations are manipulated scared i mean fear is the key to yeah. a lot of this of course entire populations who weren't really at any meaningful risk at all um it was only a very small group of people, of course, who were at risk of serious outcomes, the the elderly, the immunocompromised and the obese, and, and more often than not, people with all of those categories. And yet we were sold this kind of dishonest, everyone's at risk narrative, and the world went mad for two or three years. The people screaming at each other for not wearing cloth masks that we now know from the science had a statistically insignificant health care benefit. Um, people were, you know, arrested on park benches and on open beaches when we know lockdowns didn't work and when we know that open transmission was never a thing. Um, so uh, in, in outdoor terms, casual outside transmission, never a, a thing. So look, if they can do that with something like a pandemic, which was hardly unexpected, we've had pandemics before, we had contingency plans for them. Um, you know, how might it apply to to the yeah. subject of UFOs and extraterrestrials and and alien invasions? So we know that separately all those components exist, governments manipulating people through fear and through creating a false narrative. Yeah. But whether the actual Project Blue Beam um, false flag alien invasion is real or not, I'm a little more skeptical. But but. If COVID taught us anything, it, it should be, you know, listen to official narratives, mm. but don't blindly mm. follow them and, and sleepwalk yourself into, to, you know, total compliance mm. when, when, frankly, the science was never really there in the way that we were being told it was. So, and, and whatever you do, don't, don't suppress dissenting voices because in in these mm. polarized times where yeah. where if you look for example at, at what's going on in academia with some of the non-scientific 
narratives that are creeping in in terms of, frankly, just ideology, mm. uh, it's never been so important to allow dissent mm. and allow div genuine diversity of opinion, not a slavish adherence to the sort of diversity, equity and inclusion industry, but genuine equality genuine diversity when people have different opinions mm -hmm. um, listen to those opinions don't listen to the identity politics of who's telling the story listen to the story that's been told and, and then fact check it and I, I know that we've gone off topic and yet of I, course we haven't yeah. well no i mean that's the thing for me covid was like i've always been quite left-wing liberal and suddenly we had all these illiberal laws, lack of freedom of speech, you, like you say, dissenting voices were shut down. I'm no anti-vaxxer by any way, but, you know, we should question things. And um, we weren't questioning it. We were, the government was getting us in, in a state of fear and we were being able to be controlled. And I guess that's the point re regarding false flag operations, Project Bluebeam, is that COVID has shown that populations can be put in that fear state very quickly. Uh, so, yes. yeah. They can. I mean, if one looks back at the history of COVID, and my goodness, we should and we should learn lessons from it and not just move along and say, OK, you know, that was then, this is now. No, there must be genuine accountability for people who either got it totally wrong, mm. um, but particularly people who misrepresented the situation, knew we were, I mean, Partygate's a case in point. The real story shouldn't have been a few people breaking the rules. The real people should have been that the best briefed people in the country knew that they were at virtually zero risk of anything more than a cold. But yeah. instead of targeting our, our resources and assistance on those people genuinely at risk, we, we went mad and shut down the world and crashed the economy and set civil liberties back a generation. Still paying for it now, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, just another last question, really. Uh, obviously, you're one of the world's leading UFO experts. Have you ever considered that what we're seeing in the skies, what these credible witnesses like the pilots have given evidence to US Congress, is not physical? Is that possibly some sort of psychic or spiritual or something from another dimension? Have you ever considered those as possible? Uh, theories. Yes, hmm. so, certainly. One one should never get wedded to a, a single point of view. And although the extraterrestrial hypothesis is the one that's most deeply embedded in people's consciousness when it comes to the, the non-conventional explanations for UFO slash UAP, hmm. it's uh, frankly, it's only one of a number of competing theories, uh, interdimensional, time travelers from the future, demonic, um, one of the most interesting things in the June 25th, 2021 preliminary assessment of UAP published by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence was the statement that there's likely not a single neat solution yeah. to this mystery. There are, yeah. chances are there are a number of different things going on in parallel, yeah. and that may well be the case. So as crazy as it might sound to some, for example, there is and and of course this is this is in your film there is a faction within the particularly the us government but i've seen it in the uk as well who believe that ufos are demonic and they get this in a large part from a passage in the bible in the book of ephesians which talks about satan in terms of being quote the prince of the power of the air unquote and this faction, through that and maybe some other things too, have convinced themselves that this or some of this may be demonic. And therefore, they say mm. that you shouldn't, you shouldn't engage with it. You shouldn't study it mm. because that feeds it energy. Mm. And, and so it's an interesting irony that some of the, some of the pushback mm. to serious research and investigation of this in the US and the UK government mm. didn't come from hard nosed science minded skeptics who thought it was all a waste of time and money. Mm. It came from a believer faction, but just a different believer faction, a faction that felt it was demonic 
and that, that we shouldn't study it for the reasons I've just explained. And I, I happen to think they're wrong, mm. but but there's no getting away their influence. Lou Elizondo, mm. who headed up the Pentagon's ATIP program, which came before Arrow and before the UAP task force, mm. he said on one occasion he was trying to get a, a senior manager in the Pentagon to take this more seriously. The guy sort of batted him away and, and said, go read your Bible. That's that's the mindset that you're coming up against, a sort of mm. fundamentalist Christian interpretation of this. The day the aliens arrived was like any other day. People went about their business completely unaware of the monumental event that was about to unfold. It started with reports of strange lights in the sky, dismissed as nothing more than a meteor shower or military exercise. But as the hours passed, it became clear that something extraordinary was happening. The first contact was made in a remote field in the countryside. A small spacecraft landed gracefully, its sleek design and advanced technology unlike anything the world had ever seen. As the doors opened, a group of beings emerged, their appearance both familiar and alien at the same time. They communicated with gestures and sounds that were incomprehensible to the humans gathered around them. The news spread like wildfire, causing a mixture of fear, excitement, and curiosity among the population. Governments scrambled to establish communication with the visitors, while scientists and experts debated the implications of this historic event. Religious leaders offered their interpretations, some seeing the aliens as a sign of divine intervention, while others viewed them with suspicion and fear. As the days turned into weeks, the aliens revealed more about themselves and their civilization. They spoke of their advanced technology, their peaceful intentions, and their desire to learn from humanity. They offered to share their knowledge and resources, promising to help solve some of the world's most pressing problems but not everyone was convinced of their benevolence. Conspiracy theories spread like wildfire, with some claiming that the aliens were here to conquer or enslave humanity. Others saw them as a threat to their way of life, fearing the unknown and the changes that might come with it. Despite the skepticism and fear, the majority of people welcomed the aliens with open arms. They saw them as a chance for humanity to transcend its limitations, to reach for the stars and explore the vastness of the universe. The aliens became celebrities, their every move and word scrutinized and analyzed by the media and the public. As the weeks turned into months, the aliens began to integrate themselves into human society. They shared their technology and knowledge, helping to solve some of the world's most pressing problems. They formed friendships and relationships with humans, bridging the gap between two vastly different civilizations but not everything was smooth sailing. There were those who resented the aliens, seeing them as a threat to their way of life and their beliefs. There were protests and demonstrations, calls for the aliens to leave and return to their own world. Some even resorted to violence, lashing out against the visitors in a misguided attempt to protect themselves and their way of life. Despite the challenges and obstacles, the aliens remained steadfast in their mission. They continued to reach out to humanity, offering their friendship and their knowledge. They showed us a glimpse of the vastness of the universe, of the endless possibilities that lay beyond our own little corner of the cosmos. And as the years passed, humanity began to change. We became more united, more open-minded, more willing to embrace the unknown. The aliens became our friends, our allies, our partners in the quest for knowledge and understanding. And so, the first contact with aliens changed everything. It forced us to confront our place in the universe, to question our beliefs and our assumptions. It showed us that we are not alone, that there are other civilizations out there waiting to be discovered and explored. And as we look up at the stars, we can't help but wonder what other wonders and mysteries lie beyond our own little world. The first contact with aliens was just the beginning of a new chapter in human history a chapter filled with hope, wonder, and endless possibilities. 
A, a, a lot of uh, attention has been paid to the impact of the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence on our religions, right? If we suddenly get, you know, get evidence that shows that somebody's out there, and of course, if we can find them, they're more advanced than we are, you know, you, you might sort of regress to the assumption that, well, that's interesting and probably destructive of our, our own religious beliefs, because if they're out there and they can make themselves known, technically they're more advanced than we are. Mm. And that usually means that our religions will seem very primitive to them. You had the exact same situation in the South Pacific in the 18th century when mm. Captain Jim Cook <laughs> and others you know, started sailing around the South Pacific. And uh, he would sail into the lagoon of some island. And uh, the natives would think, well, we better switch our religion because they were you know, they were uh, worshiping things like red feathers and stuff like that. But these guys, they had things like ships, they had cannon, they had metal, they had swords. Clearly, their mojo was better than your mojo. So whatever religion they had, uh, probably was also better than your religion. So we might experience the same sort of thing. Well, thank you. And my final question is, when do you think we will get first contact? So we haven't found the aliens so far, but when are we going to find them, if ever? And uh, I somewhat infamously have a bet to anybody who's interested that we will find ET, evidence for ET, by 2035, or I will buy that person a cup of coffee. Now, uh, you know, this might be a, <laughs> maybe a rash sort of thing to have done because I may have to buy a lot of coffee. But on the other hand, I don't base that strictly on uh, un unfettered optimism. The reason I say that is that by 2035, our experiments to try and find evidence of aliens via radio transmissions or flashing lasers or whatever it is, uh, will have surveyed maybe about a million star systems. And to me, if you look at a million star systems and there's anybody out there, you're going to find somebody. So I'm willing to back up that assumption, at least to the tune of a cup of Starbucks. Okay, I look forward to my cup of cup of coffee. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That's brilliant. Thank you, sir. All right. Much appreciated. Hey. Artificial intelligence has become an invaluable tool in the search for extraterrestrial life. With the vastness of space and the limitations of human capabilities, AI has the potential to revolutionize the way we explore the cosmos. One of the ways in which AI can aid in the search for aliens is through the analysis of vast amounts of data collected from telescopes and other instruments. AI algorithms can sift through this data much more quickly and efficiently than humans, allowing researchers to identify patterns or anomalies that may indicate the presence of alien life. Furthermore, AI can help in the design and operation of robotic probes that may be sent out to explore distant planets or moons. These probes can be equipped with AI systems that allow them to make autonomous decisions based on the data they collect, increasing their chances of success in finding signs of alien life. AI can also assist in the communication with any potential alien civilizations that may be discovered. By using AI to decipher and translate alien languages or communication signals, researchers can better understand and interact with these extraterrestrial beings. In addition to using AI to search for aliens, there is also the possibility that alien civilizations may themselves send out AI probes instead of living beings. This idea is based on the concept of von Neumann probes, named after the Hungarian-American mathematician John von Neumann. These probes would be self-replicating machines that could explore the galaxy at a much faster pace than any biological beings. By sending out AI probes instead of living beings, alien civilizations could avoid the dangers of space travel, such as radiation exposure or the limitations of human lifespan. The idea of AI probes being sent out by alien civilizations raises many intriguing questions. What would these probes look like? How would they communicate with us? and most importantly, what would their intentions be? While it is impossible to know for sure, researchers have speculated that these AI probes may be programmed to seek out other intelligent life forms in the galaxy, much like our own efforts to find aliens. 
Alternatively, they may be designed to gather information about other planets and civilizations without any intention of making contact. Regardless of the motivations behind these AI probes, their existence would have profound implications for humanity. The discovery of an alien AI probe could provide us with valuable insights into the technology and capabilities of other civilizations, as well as the potential for communication and collaboration on a galactic scale. It could also raise questions about the nature of intelligence and consciousness and what it means to be truly alive. In conclusion, artificial intelligence has the potential to revolutionize the search for extraterrestrial life. By using AI to analyze data, design probes, and communicate with potential alien civilizations, researchers can greatly enhance our understanding of the cosmos and our place within it. Furthermore, the possibility of alien civilizations sending out AI probes opens up a whole new realm of possibilities for exploration and discovery. Whether we are the ones searching for aliens or being sought out by them, AI will undoubtedly play a crucial role in shaping the future of our interactions with other intelligent beings in the universe. Yeah, in fact, uh, my expectation from interstellar travel is that it's best uh, done with uh, electronic gadgets, uh, devices, mm -hmm. rather than with biological creatures, because the journey takes a long time. Even you know, to the nearest star, it will take us uh, 50,000 years to get there with uh, chemical rockets and um, artificial intelligence systems have that patience and uh, they can remain dormant for a while. We can harden them so that they survive the journey. And so uh, because it's very hazardous, there are cosmic rays and sure. uh, there, is, there are no nutrients out there in space. And mm. uh, so I can imagine sending AI astronauts uh, to those long journeys and similarly if there were other technological civilizations billions of years ago that predated us they might have sent uh, ai astronauts now our ai astronauts uh may be less advanced than theirs and mm. if they visit us of course we can use our ai systems to interpret their ai mm. systems and uh, you know they might feel kinship to them and uh, it will give a new twist on Alan Turing's imitation game, which was intended for uh, AI systems here on Earth to imitate humans, mm. uh, because we we are trying to make them in our image. Mm. But uh, in the future, our AI systems might try to imitate extraterrestrial AI systems because because they would be far more advanced. And uh, perhaps once they reach similar levels. Uh, you know, uh, that will usher our way into the class of intelligent civilizations of the Milky Way galaxy. You know, that's one way to get admitted. <laughs> well, that's amazing. I mean, in your opinion, do you think we're being visited at the moment? It's quite possible because only over the past decade, uh, we discovered the first four interstellar objects, objects from outside the solar system. Uh, and uh, Three of them, the first three, looked weird, unusual, mm. unlike uh, the familiar rocks that we found before in the solar system. It's sort of like going to your backyard and you're used to the rocks uh, that are out there, but you know, every now and then you see a tennis ball that may have been thrown by a neighbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first two, uh, one discovered in uh, January 2014 and the second in March 2017 were meteors, mm -hmm. roughly a meter in size, and they happened to collide with Earth at a very high speed, from which uh, I concluded together with my student, Amir Siraj, that they must have originated from outside the solar system because they were not bound to the sun gravitationally. And indeed, the US government confirmed that. And from the data of the US government on these meteors, we could uh, figure out that they were tougher than all the other space rocks ever detected from the solar system in the catalog that NASA compiled of 273 uh, meteors. And uh, therefore it raises the interesting possibility that, well, maybe they were artificial in origin, maybe they were spacecraft. Um, and uh, the other possibility is that they were coming from some unusual source that is very different from the solar system. We are going on an expedition to the Pacific Ocean uh, in a few months uh, during the summer of 2023 uh, to retrieve uh, the fragments left over from the first interstellar meteor. And uh, 
we will analyze the composition of anything we find at the site mm -hmm. and uh, try to figure out whether it's an artificial alloy of a spacecraft. <laughs> um, so these were the first two, uh, and they were tougher mm -hmm. than uh, you, the, the meteors from the solar system. And the third one was a much bigger. It actually, was actually 200 times bigger, uh, the size of a football field. Uh, and it, it was discovered from the reflection of sunlight. It didn't collide with the Earth, but it passed within a sixth of the Earth's sun separation. Uh, back uh, in October 2017, a telescope in Hawaii discovered it. It was given the name Oumuamua, which uh, uh, means a scout in the Hawaiian language. It had a very extreme shape, uh, most likely flat, and it was pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force because there was no cometary evaporation from it uh, that was uh, visible to the Spitzer Space Telescope. So uh, I suggested that it was very thin and was pushed by reflecting sunlight. And mm. actually, three years later, there was another object that was pushed by reflecting sunlight, no cometary tail. And uh, mm. that was September 2020. And uh, it was realized soon afterwards that it's actually a rocket booster that NASA launched in 1966. It was given the name 2020 SO, and it was discovered, rediscovered uh, by the same telescope in Hawaii. Mm. So clearly that one 2020 SO was artificial because we produced it. The question is who produced Oumuamua? Mm. The fourth uh, interstellar object appeared just like a regular comet. Uh, mm. It was uh, discovered by the amateur uh, astronomer Gennady Borisov, so it's named Borisov. So out of the four objects from outside the solar system mm -hmm. over the past decade, three are unusual. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's an indication that perhaps, you know, uh, at least one of those objects was uh, artificial in origin, manufactured by mm -hmm. uh, an extraterrestrial civilization. And then on top of that, the US government talks about objects that are unidentified uh, they want to figure it out. They established a new office for uh, anomaly resolution and in a multi multimedia, um, both in air and in water and perhaps in space. And so this office is trying to figure out what these unidentified objects might be. And um, I established the Galileo project about a year and a half ago uh, that will try to find more interstellar objects and the way astronomers find them. But at the same time, we have a new observatory that is monitoring the sky 24-7 in the infrared, optical, radio, and audio. And we analyze the data with artificial intelligence uh, classification software that will tell us whether we are looking at natural objects like birds, bugs, and so forth, human-made objects like drones, balloons, airplanes, or something else. Wow. That's fascinating. Thank you very much. My my final question uh, on the short segment is: If we did have uh, first impacts, uh, first contacts with extraterrestrials, how would that impact society? Do you think? Oh, that would be a huge uh, impact. It really depends on what we find. So there is no point in establishing a committee that will decide about procedures, uh, because I believe nature um, has a much uh, wider uh, scope of uh, uh, things to offer us than our imagination. Uh, and yeah. so uh, I think it would look nothing like uh, imagine in Star Trek uh, yeah. or in, uh, yeah. um, you know, whatever yeah. uh, script writers of science fiction thought yeah. about in the past. And um, I, I, I'm just curious, like a kid, to find out what it looks like. And then, of course, once we find something, uh, the question is um, if it's functional. I mean, it could be space trash. It could be like yeah. Voyager would be in a billion years, uh, not functional, yeah. because most stars form billions of years before the sun. So the technological clock started much earlier for most civilizations. Yeah. But um, in addition to, to space trash, there could be functional devices. And there we should figure out what they are seeking, what kind of information they want to get, or what, what is their... Um, uh, motivation uh, visiting us and only then we can decide how to respond to it and my uh, overall view is that we can learn from a smarter kid in our cosmic block yeah. and it's not really a threat the way Stephen Hawking for example talked about it I don't think we are that significant in the cosmic scheme of things and it would be to our benefit to look around 
and see what our neighborhood looks like.